um, maybe slowly sliding back into the second half. And before we get going, where people come in, chance for another question or two, if you, if you have one. Anything unclear or any of the examples that you would um, prefer to uh, have revisited? Else, I'll just, yep. Um, a little bit, but it's a, um, I think I have a slide on it. Um, did you say an, an arrow? Or, or uh, just using RCPP in our, in our own packages? Yes, no, absolutely. I, I'll come to that. There's, um, so, so in a nutshell, it, um, um, that part's easy um, if you don't have external requirements, and it gets more complicated depending on how you get to those requirements. Um, so an LPAC is... It's one thing there, but um, um, actually that is a... That is a really good point because... I may just take a diversion then and talk about that because in one of the... Iterations over the, the sort of the set of slides. I may have dropped that, um, uh, and then I put it back together from a shorter presentation. So let me let me just get out of this and go back go back over here. So um, basically, we had talked about in part one about eval CPP, CPP function, and source PPP, and I told you it's really important to um, actually go beyond source CPP and have a package, and that should really be in the three-hour presentation. I had two or three slides on that, but um, I think they're not in this, so let's, let's just insert this live. One relatively easy way um, to do this is just from a studio via new project. Um, before I go there, there's, there's really, there's sort, of, there's sort of two. I should show ours as well. If you do RCVV package skeleton and basically say my package, it will build you an empty, sort of empty, working my package at the point where you currently are, which, you know, may be in the subdirectory of a different directory, so you may not want to do it there, so, but then you could just easily, you know, I go back and forth. I tend to work more on the, on the shell prompt than something like that, so I may just, in bash, walk over and then just invoke it with R script or R, but I could now do RCPP package, my package, and that just... That just created me a legit and complete package with all files in there. The other way that I'm going to show you in just a second is, is just more GUI friendly from within RCPP. And for historic reasons, Kevin, who you know, is an RStudio employee taking care of all of this, but also an RCPP core member, um, did this as a re-implementation in the, in the RStudio code rather than calling um, RCPP package skeleton, but it's, it, it, it's close enough. One thing that, mentioning the skeleton is, 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 is decent because, where's my cursor? Um, there we go. Um, because they are, for some packages, we build variants. So Amadeo isn't loaded, so they won't, this won't execute now. But if you want an Amadeo package, you can also do this one. And that's, that's sort of decent. It's similar, for, similar for Eigen. But let's just, um, let's just pretend I hadn't done that and uh, do it this way. The menu is a little short, so new project. Oh yeah, and then it first asked me, you know, do you want to save what you currently have? And basically, for all versions of Instable for a couple of years now, it will next, so he, you say, I want a new project, and then it kind of tells you, okay, I hear you, how can I help you? And you can basically bootstrap a new project by third option, just going to GitHub and checking out an existing one, and that basically just clones it onto, onto your box. You can start from an empty new, new um, not existing directory, so basically fill an empty directory, or you can convert some work already in progress. If you've, if you've written a few files and you just want to make those a project, then you would hop in there. But the most common one is, okay, let's just completely start from scratch. And this now got a little richer and varies a little depending on what version of a studio you have. I tend to be moderately curious and adventurous to build that open now. So I run, the, I run the dailies, which I update you know, once a month or something like that. So I'm one, two, 
796, so that's probably only a week old. So, but these things, I think, appeared with the most recent release because I remember Kevin talking about that at the Studio Conf where I was present. So basically, uh, I think beforehand you just hit this one and then you had to flip a toggle to go from a package, standard R package to a package with RCPP and the toggle now generalized that you can have a plain RCPP package or an RCPP package with one of these extension packages we haven't talked about yet. So I'm just going to go here and um, then it's the same thing. It, um, uh, now I'm a bit com confused why it has a name suggested. Maybe in the session I already did that once, but you could, you could browse directories now. In temp is fine because it won't pollu um, pollute my home directory and then you can just say create directory. Ah, there we go. It needs to have a name. Interesting. Okay, so then, yeah. And then it will be live demo within minimal examples. And I can't type. And someone asked me over coffee sort of about a related question, sort of, you know, you know, how do you go to packages? This is basically the structure that you get. Um, if you're completely new to R, then there are some things here that are overwhelming and confusing. But if you already know R, then you know what this is for, what this is for, that your R code is here, that your source code goes there, um, that the R project file is just an auxiliary from, from R Studio, and R build ignore makes sure it doesn't go into the tarball. Um, but in essence, this now is, is live, and if I go to, and I think it just has hello world and the double the vector or sort of something like that. So it's, it's complete and self-contained, which is, which is how I love to work from examples, which is, which is why I always like package skeleton too. So this is enough now to kind of say, yay, you know, we built a package, because now live demo is a package, and then you can look at, what do I have in, in live demo? And you see, yeah, so there's, um, oh, that's right. The, the, the doubling of the vector was a source CPP example. So there's just a simple example of hello world in here, which returns a list object with a vector of characters and a vector of ints, and that's in here. Um, <coughs> and there's not much here. There's a single source file that, that does that, and it's all of, you know, five lines, because to return a list with two vectors, you really just can instantiate the two vectors on the fly and stick them in the list and, and, and off you go. What does this not have? It does not have a make vars file. We always used to require one under older um, build conventions um, until a rewrite around a couple of years ago. can't remember. Um, 09 or 010 or something like that. And now we don't, but if you want to link to external resources and external libraries, say something your lab has built and sits in user local lib as a shared library, you would declare that here. Um, I want to work on that a bit more and you know, write another vignette or paper on that. That's, that, that. that's a bit more involved than we sort of have time for today, sadly. But for really simple things, it's that simple. So if you, um, because now we have a package, and extending the package is then as easy as, uh, oh, come on. We'll have time for that as well. Um, um, and I will take this out because we're now on a package, and then I save this as, um, exactly, it's in the source directory, so um, just call this vecfun cpp. That thing I just saved, so exactly, so it appears here. And if I now do install and restart, my um, package just, you know, got a 100% increase in functionality because instead of a single function, now I have two functions. So one step closer to world domination. <laughs> and then, you know, the, if you don't have external requirements, linking, header files, you just put other source files in here, hit install and restart, and your package grows. And every now and then you, you, know, you save. And when you create the package, there's a toggle you can turn on whether you want a Git repo instantiated or not. And, and that's, that's sort of really, um, that's really the way to go. And that belongs in the, in the talk, so that's why we did the little, uh, little diversion. And I think besides the... Um, 
the one typo we found, I should, I should edit that in for the next version. Other questions? Said it again? Yes, uh, and it's explained in different places, but it's a bit more involved. And I, I go over that definitely in the two-day version of this tutorial. Um, um, of course, there's different stages, you know, sort of one that we get to implicitly is, um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned RCP Amadio. Amadio is a beautiful C++ library built in this town. We can get to that one by just pointing to header files. That's the ideal solution because header files just need to be shown to the compiler and you have no platform dependencies because, you know, if your R package works on a Mac, that's a compiler for Mac. If it works on Windows, that's a compiler for Windows. You just point to the headers and that's great. So building an R extension packages, package with C++ functionality that you get from a library provided only in header files, awesome. Um, that's sort of newer and a bit more involved. <clears throat> also makes compilation a little bit heavier. It, it depends on how you organize your libraries. You can't do it with all of them. The next common step is a C++ library shipped as headers and a library. And that's where trouble starts. Because if you want that viable on Linux and Mac on um, Windows, you have to make sure that on all three platforms people get access to that library. And that often means telling them, well, you know, get the sources from here and run these seven cryptic commands. And they kind of just go, you lost me at get the sources, right? So uh, there's shortcuts around it. You can bundle that library in your package, but then you need to know much more about package building infrastructure and the semantics of these make files. It's all been done. You can all get so it's just it's a bit more work. And it's also still not ideal because you will have the compilation burden each time your package is updated of recompiling that library, even though that's for all intents and purposes a constant to your project, right? So a much better way is have the library externally, but then how do you so it, it I wish that was easier, but that's a little, little out of our control. That, that's sort of the cost of portability, but great question. Anything else? We'll carry on. This will be now sort of because we just had, you know, snacks and ate something and uh, uh, will be relatively easy. So this is sort of, this is a really nice size for, site for browsing. Well, it's another brilliant JJ idea. So we set something up. It's a bunch of markdown via Ruby's Jekyll framework into, into web pages thing that sits actually at GitHub. The site is at GitHub 2. It's open contribution. If you do something cool, send us a pull request and your gallery contribution will be up there too. It's a bit like a blog and you can search it and download them. And so the first one is basically the long form version of what we did at the exercise earlier. If you have a vector, how do you sum it up? Well, it's a different variant of it because now it's cumulative sum rather than it's a total sum. So we're returning a vector with the running sum of the elements. This is how you would do it um, in C style C++, sort of same thing. You know, we, here we, now we're calling the variable ACC, accumulator, rather than S. We're creating a result vector of the required size. And then inside the loop, now we have to do two things. We have to keep our running sum updated. The plus equal is sort of a C in C++ shorthand for saying ACC equals ACC plus XI. And when you say, you know, plus equals, it just knows that, that it gets added. And then in any loop step, we're sticking ACC into the results vector. So that's, I call that sort of version one because that's, that's explicit. Never mind the um, uh, hard-nosed sort of functional programming program, propaganda. I often start with something like that because then I know exactly what's going on. And, you know, often you don't get it right on the first pass. And if you have the loop explicit, you can put a print statement in there. Or you can stop after three elements if you have otherwise 30 million, right? And, and see if the first steps were right and sort of stuff like that. It's just doing things incrementally is, 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 is sort of, in, in, in trusted paradigms is not, a, is not a bad way. But this is an equivalent solution. And that's why I had the numeric Hector already in there. But once again, with an um, STL algorithm. I'd shown you aggregate for calculating the sum for, you know, reasons they understand and we don't. The come sum they call partial sum. And here again, it's sort of use of these <coughs> iterators. Now we have three arguments. We're saying that we're using the X vector as input from begin to end. Um, implicit, I mean, this, this, this notion is there because it also allows you to only work on half the vector from the left or the right. I mean, you don't have to do from from begin to end, there could be, could be other offsets, but you basically, you define the range from which you're going to work, which here is everything, 
and stick the results into the vector res for result. Uh, we don't need an end for result because the convention, of course, is that it will have the same length as the um, segment that you're working on between begin and end. So the redundant information is given. And that fills us in the cumulative sum in there. Or again, as it was with sum earlier, we have a sugar function that does cum sum because R has a cum sum. And then uh, it just does it in the most compact way. And all of these are on a page. That's why I have that in the title, vector and cumulative sum. Let me just park out uh, for that really quickly because if you go to gallery and so it literally sits at gallery rsvp.org and if I then say search for come sum um, so that's an article from this is not very small from December 2012 sort of the very beginning of this that's just basically what I showed you a little bit of write up around it, and you can download all of this and run it and, um, but yeah, that's um, Actually, maybe I aggregated over several articles there. Who knows? I mean, but, but generally, in, in, in a couple of next slides, whatever's in the title header there is, um, 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 it is the source of the article where you can see more and a bit more write-up. Um, early on today, I told you that um, one of the things where we sort of hit a pot of gold with RCP was the fact that we get access to every single R object because everything in R is an object. If I do x assign 314, I have an R object holding this numeric value, and it's an R object. Other R objects, lists, matrices, functions, environments are also accessible, and that's super powerful, though you can misuse it, so people get carried away with that. But this example basically shows you how you can take an R function. They're easier to write. You may have them. Uh, you may use them infrequently to do a complex initialization of a really large, long-running simulation. And in the you know, relative runtime cost, it's not worth rewriting all this initialization code that exists in C++ just because. So you can just reuse the R code. So you can pass down a function from R and have it evaluated in C++ in use. So that's really good for you know, debugging, comparison. Obviously, it's still an R function. We're just calling it back from C++ because remember where we are. We are at the R prompt. We're building extension modules for R in C++ that we're linking. So we're, we're hanging off R. And all that this allows us is basically to call back to the mothership and have something executed. We're not, we're not standalone. We're always in the context of R. And, and R is around. And this is, this is one example. I think what I did there is I just... Uh, pass the Tukey 5 num function down or sort of something in the, um, on, on the slide. I don't even have output on, on, on that one here, but it's uh, any, any function f. And, and similarly, you can also instantiate functions at the, at the C++ level by their, um, from their calling environments, from their packages. Lots of examples around. But again, warning, of course, is that will not make an R function C++ fast just because we're calling it from, from C++. It's still an R function. Um, Sadly, no free lunch, no magic. We wish. Um, Sorry, Doug. What happens if F is a function defined by C++? It doesn't matter because it, you know, at the top level, it, it, the, the caller is still one. In that particular case, the function would still be fast because it's C++, but you have the overhead of calling back and forth, which is small but not, not zero. But yeah. The, the main thing is that the that the vessel of transport really is a notion of something that R thinks is a function, and that R function may be one that calls C++, but you know, it doesn't take the generality away. In the very beginning, we weren't uh, all that expressive about different subsetting elements. That got better. So in all these cases, we're looking at um, um, vector or list-alike elements and seeing how we can index them. So the first example is for numeric vector x, we can also index by Boolean, as we do in R. So this one just returns the positive elements of a vector, so it returns a subset vector. Um, we also allow for an integer vector as index vectors. So the middle examples um, just returns elements 0, 1, and 2, because we call an in, in constructed indexing vector with those numbers, and it, of course, could be non-contiguous in any way we want. It just picks up those indices, and likewise, if we have something that has names, as a list often does, then um, uh, you can also index um, 
by a character vector. Um, one of the earlier solutions for subsetting was one that farmed out to Amadio. So I'm introducing Amadio in passing here. We come back to it uh, in a little bit later. Amadio is awesome. Um, it's sort of aiming at people familiar with MATLAB and the MATLAB expressiveness for sort of matrix expressions and doing it in C++. I had worked with C++ libraries sort of all the way back to grad school as I did some simulations on relying on one of those in my dissertation. And this one is actually a really cleverly written and cleanly written and well documented one. It's sort of I'd seen quite a few others before, and uh, yeah, this one, this one's a keeper. So that was one of the first things that we packaged up for uh, for RCPP. Um, Amadio has a slightly different convention for this. Um, um, in the first one, so what we're having here basically, because Amadio is in C++, so it has a it's a richer type structure than we do in, in, in R. It has matrix and vector. The vector could be column vector or row vector. It defaults to column vector. But um, it also has integer vectors and integer matrix. And it just prefixes it with an I, I met, I vec. But it also, and that's what we're seeing here, has unsigned. For unsigned, we don't have a direct um, equivalent in, in R because we don't have unsigned times. But when you're subsetting and indexing, Amadio requests um, unsigned indices um, for storage efficiency or range maximality or, or, or what have you because indices cannot be negative, so you may as well put them in an unsigned operator. So what we're doing here is the matrix M comes in and we're just creating a logical expression, but that's not assigned to a bool because the indices have to be UMAT. That's just how that works. And uh, so the, the logic expression then just gets transformed into, into unsigned integer 1 and 0. Wherever the element of the transpose is greater than the original matrix, uh, we want that element. And the indexing basically happens by putting that uh, index matrix A into a from call. And um, uh, then we have to do a casting because the unsigned matrix you couldn't return to, 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 to A, so then we're passing it back to a normal numeric matrix M, and that's done with this conf2 version. That's, that's just a bit of calling convention, which is a little, little heavier, um, something slightly easier. Uh, you can also put logical expressions into ARMA find. That one will just create you the unsigned matrix basically on the fly, and that, uh, you know, here we're creating a matrix Z as an, as an outer product of M, and it finds all elements where Z is greater or equal to 100. Uh, really big topic and really versatile topic around C++ is boost. Um, boost is maybe just about 20 years old, um, give or take, give or take a year. Um, yeah, late, late 90s. It was an, an extremely ambitious um, and, and novel undertaking. They basically put sort of the notion of really stringent peer review to open source code. It's a really well-respected, high-level, complicated C++ library collection. And you can submit code to it, and it gets reviewed. It's often in purgatory and under review process for years. And when it finally gets accepted, it's just generally uh, high-quality code. Um, you know, I work in industry. I often have colleagues who are sort of fully trained C++ engineers, and yeah, and Boost is, you don't have discussions. I mean, anyway, it gets complicated with some design things, but it's, nobody sort of contests the, 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 the quality of it. And we wanted, of course, some of that in our space, and some packages already used it. And um, Jay Emerson and Michael Kane and I had hummed and hawed about it for a couple of years. Yes, we should, and maybe we would, and what have you. And then at one point, uh, um, Jay sat down and wrote the first version, and then I, I sort of took over maintaining it. And we called that, we called that BH. There's a, there's a <laughs> silly technical reason for that, that, uh, you know, it's one of those R things. They're still using a tar implementation that has a limit on the file names. And if you've ever seen boost source code, there's boost. So there's include, boost, library name, subdirectory, another subdirectory, feature, function, something, other. So the things get really, really long. So among the, I think in the first release, there were some 11,000 files or sort of something like that. And now we're up to 50,000. That's a bit of, bit of a problem how big this has got, but that's a sort of a different story. 
among those thousands of files, there were a handful that were too long in length. So we got rid of a couple of the length exceedances by changing the not yet published package name from boost headers to BH because that saved us eight or sort of something like that. And after that, it was only sort of two of them. So that's, that's why the thing is called BH for boost headers. Usually I'm not, not always that cryptic. Um, this is an old example, something simple, something that at the time, I think we already had in one or two uh, helper packages. It just computes your GCDs and LCMs, greatest common divisor and least common multiple lowest common multiple, so if you go in with two numbers, it just, it just does the math stuff. And this thing is awesome, back to your usage example from earlier, because a very large subset of boost is just headers, no linking. And that was the winner to the creation of this package. I mean, we can just, it's up on CRAN, you have a particular form of depends with it, it's called linking to uh, in the description file, and that just means that when your package builds, it will have BH around in a place where the compiler finds it, all it does is looking for the headers, and it then finds them. The main cost to it right now is the, is, is the footprint, which is large, but there's, there's an awful lot of really awesome functionality in here. Here I just took really simple ones so that they fit on the, on the page. Um, here's another one. That's an older boost library called Lexical Cars. Many of them have weird names, uh, have really dense documentation, but Lexical Cars is basically a converter to and from and it's templated and it goes both ways. So what I'm doing here is that I'm going from string to double. There are also some that do it the other way around and for the demo basically I'm sticking in 1.23.4, a thousand, foo, 42 and a symbolic expression and what I'm getting back is all the ones that you would expect to come back. It doesn't know what number to turn foo into um, and it doesn't know that pi over 4 has sort of a math meaning because, you know, there's no, there's no symbolic math analyzer behind it. And that just works by, um, um, by basically, sort of runs over a loop. Uh, ignore the try for a second. I'll talk about that just, and then just basically lexical cast V of I. And again, that's the use of how one templates in C++ and basically <coughs> says, um, I want this cast into a double type because res of i, uh, where is res? Yes, standard vector of double allocated there. And in this particular case, you're seeing an idiom, which we also have in R, of um, dealing with a bad situation via try and catch. Um, sometimes these calls, something like lexical cars, can have, it's a bit like, um, you know, only the tip of the iceberg that you see and you don't quite know how much is under the water. There could be a lot of sort of other stuff. And one simple way of recovering from an error condition is to throw an exception. And that does the try and catch. And in that particular case, you would be, if something goes bad, you find yourself in the catch branch. And then we know how to do something controlled with it. Because as we know that we're returning a numerical vector, we can assign a numerical uh, an A. And that's how we get those two there. Um, yeah, use of exception is sometimes sort of quasi-religious in C++ projects. Some want them, some don't. If you look at Google C++ um, design document or, or coding conventions, they don't want them because they have really big executables and if they just, you know, throw an exception somewhere and blow up, that's, that's not good. They always want to recover from errors. But anyway, that, that's sort of, that's a local design deployment, deployment issue. This is something, I work in finance. This is something that I got from a friend in New York a couple of years ago. That's sort of a common thing. Um, there's a particular set of important contracts that settle um, on the third Wednesday of a month every third month, every quarter. Um, you know, there's March, June, September, December. Um, I am Euro Dollar Futures and you need to do a little bit of calendaring magic and we didn't have that in R yet. And that is sort of relatively high level meant to read for humans. So there's a helper function that comes back that computes you the nth day of the week in the month given um, given which week you want, could be first, second, third. Here I'm using an enumerator, nth day of the week in months, colon, colon, third. So I want a particular day in the third week. And here I'm saying Wednesday. Also note that Wednesday is not in quotes. So that has become in the scope of Boost Gregorian, where, you know, using namespace, I, I flattened that. It's a, it's, a, it's a known constant. And man here is an argument. And we also need the context of the year. So given month and year, I come back with the, um, 
with the date of the um, um, of the Wednesday of the third week, and you know, doing a little bit of handshaking between boost dates and, and RCBP date times. Um, C++ 11 gave us a for each equivalent, a for each um, loop construct, um, or a more, a more generalized loop, for loop construct that behaves like a for each. C++ didn't have that beforehand, but boosted, defined in all uppercase boost for each, which is a bit ugly, but here's a usage example of how you can just sweep over a set with a for each. So it's basically, you know, it's a more, it's a more expressive functional loop. In comes a numerical vector x, and we're just saying, for each element of x, bring me back element times element. And you know that, that doesn't need anything with begin, end, or indexing, and sort of it's some, some programming goodies, sort of all the stuff so that's. The, what's the made up of the double? Yes, um, good. Um, So I hit set C, right, and dragons, and how dangerous, and pointers, and this and that. So uh, basically, um, in C, you had two calling conventions. You copied, you, you called by reference, or you called by value. Calling by reference meant that you called with the address of a variable, turning into a pointer, and then you could assign to that. You would always have to dereference the pointer, so there would be a star operator in that, and all that. C++ did away with that, and did one, a little sort of basically a middle ground which is cleaner and that's that when you have double lm without the ampersand you're passing by value and it's Im immutable you can't change the value you can't bring it back if you um, it's sort of a little hid hidden here um, because we're just in comes numeric vector x we're returning x and we're not quite explicit about which element of X we're actually altering, but that's, that's why we need the ampersand here, because it means that the element that we're getting from X, we're replacing with its, with its square. And for that, we want to call by reference, and that's what the ampersand does. So that was a pretty slick sort of C++ middle ground, because it allows you the ability to alter the value of a variable and send it back without having to be sort of in, in, in pointer notation. So it's a little cleaner, but that's, yeah, that's, that's called by reference. You often see that doubled with a, with a const that precedes it, because that's another clever middle ground, because then you pass it by reference, which if the object is big, it's much cheaper, because you're just effectively passing it with a pointer, eight bytes, rather than the gigabyte of memory that it, that it contains. But if you're then qualifying with a const, you're also guaranteeing that, no, 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 don't change this thing ever, and, and, and but there. Yeah. Minutia. That's why the C++ intro is 1,400 pages. There's, there's lots of that. Um, but this topic of linking. So this is, this is actually, yeah, that, that is an answer to one of the coffee conversations over the break. So this is one worked example that I put on the, um, on the gallery to how to deal with that. Because Boost really is, oh god, 60, 80 or so libraries. Uh, not all of them are in BH. In BH are some that people wanted, that we found useful, that were used otherwise, and also those that don't require linking. That in some cases means that we have subsets of full boost libraries, sort of that not everything is in there. So for example, we have the date and time functionality minus, I think, the parsers and the formatters, because we don't need them, because we can pass dates at the R level and we can also pretty print them at the R level. The parsers and formatters do string operations and that you cannot do header only, for that you need linking. This is similar. So this is a worked example of doing regular expressions via Boost. Boost has a powerful regular expression engine. It's sort of yet another format of the regexes. This one actually didn't take off as much as the, for example, the Perl one that we have in, in R. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good example. This code can only work if you link against it. Now, one possible way to have your code respect that is that you, in your R session, for example, say, sys set environment, so you're using the R function that sets um, an environment variable, and it's pretty similar to what you would write in a makevars file in a package, because you're saying package libs, so for the current compilation context, also link against the library boost underscore regex. Um, and if your system has boost in a place where the linker knows how to look for it, 
which is the case on most sane Unix systems, because boost is pretty common, I would think is the same with brew, then this will work. Um, no luck for Windows, because there simply is no, um, there's just no convention where to look for libraries, so you would have to replace that with the minus capital L, you know, C colon, users, you know, Fred, if your name is Fred, projects, and, 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 and so on. And this is taken from the demo for Boost Regex. It just shows how you would pass for um, credit card numbers because it's four digits, three digits, four digits. So sort of slightly different patterns from phone numbers, say. And, you know, there's the Boost Regex, and then in comes a string of numbers, and out goes a Boolean sort of, is that a valid, or is that a, a possible credit card number, yes, yes or no. Um, yeah, and, and that's why this is a devil, um, because you can set a system in, uh, an environment variable on every system, but you do not know whether that system will have these boost libraries there, so you can't really distribute code like this. It's not really CRAN compatible that way, so depending on external libraries is still, still work in progress. It's, it's just hard. Um, Another cool topic, uh, X-pointer. So X-pointer is another X expression type, just like links, function, environment, and is used, for example, one of the earliest ones that I've seen in packages like RODBC or other packages um, connecting to a database. It allows you to wrap a pointer to some other C or C++ structure you, you may not know and that R doesn't know and just put stuff, um, put stuff um, around it. Um, I've used that with some luck um, in, a, in an example for an optimization package where we allow a compiled function, a C++ function, to be passed down from the user to the optimization as the, um, as the objective function. And that's written up in the gallery in, in this particular one in this sort of a stripped down version of it. Um, it's a bit technical, so bear with me. So the setup here is that we're using RCBB Amadeo. And brilliant as I am as a presenter, of course, I still haven't introduced you to Amadeo, but we'll get there. So this now um, has an include header. And because we did Amadeo and we know it's prefixed with RCPP, you won't use it without RCPP, that already gives you RCPP. So generally, please don't include RCPP Amadeo and RCPP because then there's two different cases, the sequencing matters, and bad stuff happens, and we actually detect that and yell at you. So RCP Amadeo gives you RCVP. So it's, it's, one for the, it's two for the price of one. Awesome. Um, and then here I just did a shortcut again and flattened both namespaces because by now we sort of have a feel for what's RCVP and what's, what's ARMA. So all I'm doing here is VAC and those are ARMA functions. So for ARMA actually that works pretty well. So here's the const ambassand, constant reference thing. So I'm basically having, I'm offering a user a choice between two functions to compute with one of which doubles a value and the other one increments by 10. We're calling them function one and two. In comes a vector, out goes the double of the vector or the vector shifted by two, by, excuse me, by 10. Sort of straightforward, sitting in a source file, no export tag here, so they're, they're not coming back to, to R, they're really just C++ function. But then I have to do a little bit of machination to, um, to, to get to it. And Type def is one of those magic things where you can attach different labels for underlying code representation. It's, it's, it's pretty close to scary, but so just, just bear with me here. So we're just basically saying that we will have a function pointer, so a pointer to a function returning a vec, taking a const reference vec on the, on the um, inside. It looks pretty much like the signature of a function call. The only thing that's scary is that it's actually a pointer to a function, and that pointer context I have to protect by the, by the parents. I had warned you before that pointers are hair splitting, so exactly, that's sort of one of the examples. We can't quite do that without it, but we only need this thing um, then in the next setup. So here we basically have one user controlled switching function. The main thing that it does is it retrieves um, from the user a string that I call f string here for function string or function selection string. And it basically does one of two things. If the string was fun one, we're returning something turned into a compatible function pointer from fun one. If it's fun two, it's fun two. Try to ignore all the line noise on sort of character columns, you know, from, from return to the end and focus on the <coughs> fact that we're having ambassador fun one, ambassador fun two. 
because fun one and fun two were these trivial functions on the previous slide that did the x plus x or the x plus 10. The rest in front of it is just basically machinery that I need so that I can ship function pointers around. What that does is that it creates um, a new function pointer for each of those um, used to instantiate an X pointer object, that's the RCPP machinery, templated to the fun pointer, where earlier up there had said a fun pointer returns a vec and um, takes a const reference vec, so which is the signature that I'm working with. And then to be um, sort of semi-proper and prudent, we cover an error condition if the user selected a third function or had a typo or we can't fulfill that request. But in essence, uh, this thing that I call put fun pointer in X pointer is just basically a string driven constructor. The user passes down a string, a bit of text, and then we're using that. How does that resolve at the C++ side? So here, I will be operating on a vector X using an X pointer as, as expression. Um, to be able to interface with R directly, I'll just keep that as an X expression. Thing that I glossed over was that the, the single interface from R that we do everything with just operates straight on S expressions. I think I could have X pointer, fun pointer in the signature by now too. In the beginning we couldn't, so I just left it that way. It's just, it's just an additional line. I then take the XP sex, let's set an argument there, and instantiate my XP fun. That again uses this X pointer, um, templated, conditioned on this use pattern that I have here with these two functions. Now I have XP fun. I do this thing that one does with pointers. I dereference it. That's the star operator in XP fun. And finally, by the third line in that function, I now have basically a clean function object fun. Fun now just is a function. I just had to sort of wrap it up really tightly to perfect specification of the US postal system and with the right stamp on it so that it you know, did everything right in transit. And when I do that, it arrives there. And then I can just do the really trivial vector y is equal to the evaluation of my input vector of x evaluated by function. And it's, it's completely free flow. The function could now be anything. I mean, I kept it simple and short so that it fits on the slides and we're just alternating between um, two functions, but you could be in a you know, really complex optimization and switching between 10 different, you know, gradients. Or so it could be, could be anything. You have access to other variables, so it's, it's pretty good. And then we're just returning Y, which is the evaluation of the load X and the, you know, the shrink-wrapped um, function pointer. I know this is a little ticky, but it's, 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 it's powerful. And then from R, this is just, this is all that you would do to use it, given the machinery that we've put in place. We had built ourselves a selector that gave us the ability to select either function one or function two, given a string calling for function one or function two. Now, fun is this proper argument that, that does that with the shrink wrapping, and call via X pointer was this thing where on the left, I had an argument to apply to, to, to be consumed by the function and then this function pointer. So now, I would take the values one to four and they would be evaluated by fun one, which a few slides ago was the one that doubled, so I get 2, 4, 6, 8 back. If I did it with fun 2, I would get 11 to 14 back. And that's, yeah, it's completely generic. So you can use that to ship anything where you need C++ code down. I mean, you know, Gibbs samplers, gradients, objective functions. Um, but, yeah, it's a bit more advanced use. And it's, it just shows you sort of stuff that is at the gallery because we're going from really simple examples to some a bit more complicated ones and that was one of the more complicated ones, but still good enough for four slides. So plugins is important for extension mechanisms. Um, any, any questions on the stuff that we did there? I don't want to drag on it sort of too much because it's hard. It's maybe best for hallway conversation, but so plugins. Plugins is extension mechanism, and this is sort of a bit more how it's, how it's built in, just showing a few of those. The, the page is also... Um, I guess outdated in the sense that even on Windows we no longer have the C++ OX uh, flag. I think that was under the old version of, uh, of R tools. I think it's still an RCPP because of course some installations still have it, but you don't really need it anymore. And that just basically shows some of the stuff that happens behind the scenes to put things like OpenMP, parallelism, uh, C++ 11, and other things. And in essence, what we're doing is when we're encountering a particular plugin, 
based on the value of the plugin, we're passing down particular um, environment variables that the, us, the, the R build system picks up. We had already seen package libs uh, in the boost regex example. Here we're using package libs again and also the compiler flags. Uh, the main thing is that this is really not super complicated. If you have the need to create a plugin and uh, support one in one of your packages, it's, um, it's super doable. A couple of packages do it. Um, here's a simple use example again of um, how you turn on C++11 if your compiler has it but doesn't default to it yet. Um, we'd seen that a couple of slides ago. Um, here the compiler will now correctly guess that because 42 is assigned to the variable val, that val will be of type int. If it was 42.0, it would assign it to a dump. And we get that working by having an additional attribute other than RCPP export, and that's the one with RCPP plugins, where here I wrote CPP 11 in quotes. Um, I think because we're picking that up, not with string evaluations, but with regexes, the, um, the quotes are actually um, uh, spurious. You can use them, you don't have to use them. And I've used it both ways in both places, which is a bit confusing. Um, I don't think so, because, because I, th I think it's only atomic types that, because that's really a compiler feature, not an RCVP feature, so, and, you know, sort of numeric vector, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, no, it's a good, I hadn't tried that, because now, um, you know, you can have curly brace instantiation of multiple arguments, you can instantiate a vector, which beforehand you couldn't, you could declare a vector of so many elements, and then set one, set another, set another, um, it's a fair question. Um, you know, also was sort of a big hoopla when, RCP, when C++11 was, was new a couple of years ago and we all used it for the loop constructs and all the rest of it. The, uh, uh, it it's sort of common ground now and the excitement is a bit more muted, but it's, it's a fair question that I do not have the answer to about exactly where the, where the limit to it is. Whatever the compiler can resolve, um, uh, resolve unambiguously. Um, sort of one known thing, for example, was in C11, you could only ever use it in the body of the function, but not for the return value, and that's something that I think 14 brought, or 14 tried to bring, and then 17 finally. I mean, it's sort of, it's there by now, but it, it's not yet at that level, so it's just, you know, increments and increments. So, I think it can, although it can be used on the SDL types, whatever, yeah, that's a good question. I'll, I'll, I'll try that, yeah. Yeah, so this, for example, would be an example, right? So here, here I'm showing this other, what I just mentioned, the other C++11 feature that people quite liked because it was clearly missing from 2003. If you have a vector of characters and you want to assign three elements to it, well, you know, what you always had to do was say vector of standard string and then push back blurry, push back curly, push back mo, or, or declare it a vector of three elements and assign 0, 1, and 3 explicitly. And it was only C++11 that gave us the ability to take the entire set on the right-hand side and, and, and assign it. Um, yeah, and the open question now is whether we could replace standard vector, standard string with auto. I shall try that, but not right now. Um, and yeah, this is, I mentioned that on the boost for each page. Uh, this is, uh, the, so the, the added benefit of boost for each is now a little less than what it used to be a couple of years ago when we didn't have this, but with C++ we have this now. Um, here is now for changing things up a little. Uh, it's not a cumulative sum. Now we're having cumulative product. Um, so it's again, it's a reduction. We have a vector of elements and we're just returning an int. So this guy iterates over all elements of vec and multiplies the, uh, the values out. Um, and yeah, and equally quick, another thing that was new and is sort of old, old story for us, lambda functions in C++ and R, we had that all along. It's these implicit functions we use in S apply, L apply, and all the other stuff. But here, this is a new thing. The syntax convention that was devoted was square bracket, square bracket basically as a function name. That's the enon function. So here now I'm using the standard transform I'd shown you earlier that uh, takes an incoming vector x from begin to end assigns to an outgoing vector y starting at begin and sweeps the supplied function over all elements. And beforehand, 
we had to use a function, or strictly speaking, a functor that we had to define beforehand to pass through, or, or a standard function like you know, square root or sort of something. And now we can, uh, can do it with a, with a function defined on the, on the fly, a lambda function. And um, I think I'm going to skip some of this or go real quick. So here's, here's a, a made-up example of an expensive uh, computation where I just have two nested loops and I'm com com computing the um, uh, distribution function of the log norm, um, which is reasonably expensive uh, if you do it many, many times for very big NB. And this just does a you know, big O of n squared serially. And here's a simple example of how you could do this with OpenMP. OpenMP is uh, a maybe also by now 20 year old standard. The release is now number f at four. It's something that typically ships with your compilers. Uh, there was a bit of friction on the Mac OS side because for reasons that I as a non-Mac user never quite understood, there was something between what Simon and Accor didn't like about what Apple did with the compiler, so we had or didn't have it for, but you know, worked wonderfully on Linux for many, many years. Worked, but not wonderfully on Windows 2, not with quite the same performance boost, and essentially it gives you a somewhat ugly looking and relatively sort of low level way of making your functions parallel. <coughs> Basically, the lowest, lowest level brown line there is we're saying that we want an OpenMP parallel, dynamically scheduled for loop, and then the, the loop that there follows, the loop indexed by i, will be spread over multiple threads, and uh, each j loop in there belongs to the, to the thread. Yep? This one should be turned into a package, or it can be one? Uh, no, you can do that with a plugin. So this works with source CPP, but you can also do it in the context of a package. If you do it in the context of a package, you have to give the minus f OpenMP um, to the to the make was and um, there are a number of packages on CRAN that that do that. That used to be rarer. I'm trying to think. I, th I think we're also doing it now for um, losing my turn of thought. For Amadio, because Amadio uses OpenMP internally for speeding up a couple of things. It's it's sort of it's a low hanging but not. Uh, low-hanging fruit, but it's not cheap because you have to basically go in. But, but Conrad, for example, did that in, in Amadio in a couple of places. There are certain operations having to deal with matrices and vectors where you, you know, where, where it's embarrassingly parallel and sort of something like that works. I actually had that internally in some places for a couple of years too. Sort of some of the special functions. I think the distribution function for the Tukey distribution was always the token example. That one's expensive. And when you have OpenMP, then all of a sudden, and you have eight cores, then you have sort of a 5x speed up versus when you, when you don't do it. But it's sort of, it's still tricky because you need to know how big your payload is, that it actually, that it's worthwhile spreading out over different cores because suppose here your NB was only five, then, you know, then the communication overhead beats it. So it, 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 it's tricky. But, but I'll, I'll come to a better alternative in just a second. And then, you know, just this example on my machine, and I think that then got recalculated on this laptop rather than on my server. So not too, too many cores, but um, you see that the total compute time is either 22 seconds or 25 seconds with the commu com computing overhead. But in the 25 second case, because we're using four threads, the elapsed time is only seven seconds, whereas beforehand it was still 22 seconds. So we, uh, um, OpenMP can be, can be really useful, but it's a bit more laborious to use. Enter RCPP Parallel. So RCPP Parallel is a package written by Kevin and JJ from our studio, which hooks into another product of Intel's, which is sort of one level on top of OpenMP, and it's called um, um, TBB, Intel TBB, Threaded Building Blocks. And it has a higher abstraction level, and it doesn't require you to be quite as sort of quasi-assembler-like as OpenMP. And here's an example of, made-up example of doing a transformation on a matrix, where you're basically coming in with a, with a source matrix auric, and we're returning a transform matrix mat. So mat gets uh, initialized by the same dimensions, and then we're having a single transform call from beginning to end, because remember, a matrix really is just a vector with dimension attributes. It's a continuous piece of, 
of memory. So each matrix element is just a single cell, so I can just sweep through. And each element, it just takes the square root. And we don't need to know whether a matrix element is index 3,5 or 7,2. If we want to square root all of them, we can just go through linearly. That's, that's mathematically correct. But it's a linear operation on a bit matrix, so we can do it in parallel. And this is, this is now the parallel version of it. And this is where this business about the iterators that we glanced up comes in, because Intel TBB uses clever heuristics to take a big chunk and slice it into smaller chunks, choosing well how big those chunk sizes are. And what happens there is that to have a framework compatible worker function, you have to, um, of course, um, have the RCB parallel package loaded. The depends uh, tag does that via source CPP. Um, if you did CPP function, which you don't want for longer code like this, you would have to do it this function argument, but that's what depends does. And um, for something that gets us the parallel work context, we always have to derive of their class worker. So that's the C++ lingo for that. I've shown you structs, and I had sort of simplified it a little that structs is just data, and classes is data plus code. It's actually not quite that clean cut. Structs can, anyway, structs is like class, but with only public members. All detail that doesn't matter, but we, you know, we have to we have to adhere to the API format of worker, and that's done by uh, inheriting from it. So we're doing a square root class that derives from worker, and in there again we have an input matrix and an output matrix. These are now this is very important of type R matrix. We cannot use numeric matrix as we would do in RCPP because R is single threaded. You can call out from R into code that is parallel do all your business in parallel, come back to R at the end, and you're safe. What you cannot do is call out from R, compute code in parallel, and at any one point in the parallel in, in computation, call back into R. Hell breaks loose. Never ever do that. And, I mean, literally, because the, you know, R is not set up for it, and its memory management goes, goes haywire, which means, among other things, that we cannot use the RCVP data types because they're super efficient, uh, very narrow proxies on top of the R data types. And if we were to use those, we could tickle an R event, a memory allocation. We could, even without explicitly calling back, trigger one of those callbacks. So that's why it's, and it's sort of, it's standard answer when someone comes to say overflow, oh, my RCB parallel went hey, why? I kind of, oh, do you use RCBP types? Yeah, no, don't do that. We tell you all the time to use R matrix or R vector. They're basically, they're separate memory, uh, and, and you can't have cross effects. And then everything's good. So all you have to do basically is, is come in with our numeric matrix input output, but um, pass the numeric matrix input output to the internal R matrix input output. It's just, it's just mechanics. It's just what we have to do. The actual work, then it's just something like that where, we, where we're um, defining an operator parent, parent, that's sort of, again, C++ lingo. Don't focus on that. The more important part is it's an operator that works on a chunk from the beginning to an end, which is us saying, given a chunk of work, what do we want to do with it, which we're handing back to TBB, which then does the magic with it, because this is the work that we want done, and TBB then figures out where and how to do it over our multiple cores, generally in the near best possible way without, have, without us having to be specific about it. And that's, that's a godsend. That's just... That's just like how the parallel package made parallel computing from R really easy. And here it's just really the same because it's, it's um, for our current argument begin and end, and we're just using those as offsets to the overall beginning and end. So if the matrix has 100 elements, beginning and end may now be 40 and 50. And that just says work from elements 40 to 50 and put the results into output begin, also 100 elements, so then it's 40, and apply square root where we're just, you know, using standard library function square root for the, for the transformation. And the key to using RCB parallel really is to have a compatible operator like that. More complex things, of course, will have uh, more complicated operator functions, but that's, that's the paradigm that you would have. And then in order to deploy it, all you have to do is write your RCBP function, the signature we're familiar with, export tag, 
out a numeric matrix, in a numeric matrix, our R compatible types, um, reserve space for an output, then use both of those to instantiate that bit of code that we just worked on, the ASPI parallel interface code to TBB, square root, in goes numeric matrix X, in goes output, and then use that square root object as an argument to the parallel for loop where we're saying we want the work to be done over our entire matrix from the beginning to the end, basically from zero to length. And that's all there is, because then TBB takes over and knows, oh, your machine has eight cores, huh? You let me have as many cores as I want, so I will take eight. Your matrix has 8,000 elements, so maybe I'll start by working on eight chunks of 1,000. I don't know, it's heuristics. Maybe it would think, ah, oh, you know, maybe I'll use 32 of 250. I don't know. I mean, but there's a trade-off between having chunks too small, having chunks too, um, too little, but it's, it's, it's good. And basically, you get sort of the usual parallel computing paradigms with it. There's a parallel four, there's a parallel map apply, and it's, it's, it's pretty nifty. And Colin did, um, Colin, Kevin did really, really hard work to make sure that it also still builds and is available on, on Windows. So you can use that on a beefy enough Windows computer too. I mean, you know, with the, with the constraints that the OpenMP stuff is, is I think, a little closer to the wire on, on Unix platform, but it's, it's good. Um, and maybe I should have put that at the end, but anyway. So that was just a little detour about, there's the RCPB gallery. There's over 100 pieces. I sort of picked a selection of them that were somewhere between really simple and getting a bit more complicated or really complicated with the X pointer. And now it's sort of back for the last hour to applications, a little bit of Amadio, and then segue from Amadio to, um, to MALPAC. So updated that yesterday evening, as of yesterday evening, almost 1,400 packages on CRAN using RCPP, which is mind boggling. Um, among those, the biggest one is RCPP Amadio with almost 500, which is also stunning. Another big one is Eigen, which is used, among others, by LME4 and Arsten. Eigen is sort of an alternative to Amadio, which I personally use less. It, at one point, sort of had a reputation of being more powerful or more performant or richer. It definitely has a richer interface. Um, it also has more confusing documentation. Most of the things that I want, I actually get from Amadio, and I find that I get them done quicker. So I just mostly stick to Amadio. But, but Eigen is, is a good piece of work, too. And there's some nice extensions in there that I always wanted to look at this. There's something having to do with uh, automatic differentiation. There's, there's some clever stuff in there. And the reason it came in here was that when Doug Bates needed it a couple of years ago, it had decent sparse matrices, and Amadio didn't. Uh, time passed. Uh, Conrad is very productive. And by now, Amadio also has pretty decent sparse matrices. So, but it is what it is. So LME4 and R stand are definitely over on that. And we also have an interface to the GSL, but I won't talk about that. So Amadio, Brisbane. Um, that's um, an older version of the homepage because it still says NICTA. Um, um, that changed organizationally a little. And, Conrad and his lab are now part of a different uh, organization. I think it's still co-associated with NICTA. It's sort of an Australian research organization. There are a couple of these bullet points. I left them there. That's still mostly unchanged. It may now have one for sparse. I can't quite remember. But it's sort of, you know, it's a C++ library for, for, for math, really, for linear algebra, for the stuff that we do with matrices and vectors, um, which aims to be both performing and easy enough to use. <coughs> Uh, aiming at MATLAB users, and does uh, ins, floats, complex numbers. No bools, no chars. So if you have things that work on text or logical, logical you can map, of course, to ins, but it goes. And it uh, works transparently with, you know, LAPAC, MKL, BLAS, which are you have, one you have on the system. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, again, this is taken from its website. That's the same bullet points, but in case the screenshot wasn't good enough to, to read. Uh, so a fair amount of um, documentation on the website. When I started using that, there was just an internal, basically a technical report, a NICTA paper by Conrad. Um, then he and I replied to a call for papers in, in CSDA, so we introduced SVP Amadio, and there have been a few papers by Conrad and Ryan Curtin, who's the main author of MLPAC. Um, 
the Journal of Open Source Software, sort of a really brief one. The, um, the 2018 one is, is more recent on sparse matrices. First reference to MLPAC, that we'll get to briefly at the end too. So MLPAC is pretty cool, and it happens to use Amadio as its matrix representation, which is rare, because when people go off and build um, machine learning implementations, they often reinvent their own sort of matrix classes, and then you have to translate from one to the other, and here basically we get the, the matrix representation for free, which is, which is pretty good. Um, what, what are highlights? Uh, this again is a, is a templated library, a header-only library, so that makes deployment and shipping really, really good. No linking. If you use this in a package, all you have to do is linking to RCVP Amadio as well as RCVP. Um, fully automated converters from RCVP and uh, pretty, pretty performing. Um, simplest, so the Hello World case, really, and this, I think, is also from the, um, from the gallery, is something like this. We need the include file for Amadio. As I mentioned in passing before we introduce this, it gets us RCVP as well. Um, we need the depends line, which uh, without it, when R, CPP calls R to compile this, it, um, it, it, it wouldn't know to tell R also to look for the Amadio headers. That's what the depends does, basically. The usual export tag, and then, you know, in goes a matrix. We're calling eigen decomposition of a symmetric matrix M. Uh, we didn't test for symmetry or whatever, but glossing over that, which returns us a vector, and so we have a signature vector out in matrix. And uh, if you run that, it's, you know, unsurprisingly, of course, the exact same result as R gives for eigen, subject to the fact that eigen decompositions are not nailed down to the ordering. It's actually in the help page for R's eigen function, so... 0 and 2, and 2 and 0 are really the same. Because, you know, for an eigen decomposition, that nothing says whether you have to order them from left to right or right to left. So that, that sometimes happens. Um, but yeah, for the matrix, sort of, you know, token matrix, 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1, um, which is. And um, with that, we can try another, um, a, a third exercise, um, because I've shown you the depends line. That's what you need, and that's what that signature looks like. So I can keep that up, but see if um, we sort of, you know, if you want to cheat, you can look at it as well. If you ask our studio for a package with us, we have that's the default file that comes back, because it's, it's, it's a nice enough example. Write a function that takes in a, a vec, or you can make it ama call vec, and then place with transpose um, such that you, in one version, in, write two functions. In one, you get an inner product, so uh, x transpose times x, and in the other, you get an outer product, x times x transpose. I think that was right for the call vector. Um, you can work that through. And to, for the inner product, because you're returning a scalar, you need a thing called s scalar. So try that for a minute, and uh, I, will, uh, I will at the same time try to um, improv that too. And I may also go... Um,
So I got lucky with odd and error on the first one. And the second one, of course, is a little trickier because we have to cast to the double. <coughs> Which, you know, I'll admit that as much as the next guy, I have to look up each and every other time as well. see on my screen now that our studio is yelling at me, so there's something it doesn't like. Oh, um, yeah, it doesn't understand that I actually have the header context there. I can't quite remember what the deal with that was, but I think I can ignore it. Well, <clears throat> now I surprised myself because um, I guess I looked at that often enough. So one possible solution is this, and it's <coughs> the main trick really is that Amadeo is a little strict on the types and doesn't automatically downcast from uh, uh, a vector times a vector that will be vector of length one down to a double. So we have to be explicit with that as scalar converter. And uh, if I wanted to be, as I usually am, if I wanted to be very specific, then I would do something like that prefix all of these, and then I wouldn't need this one, I think. I was saying very explicitly what we're taking from armor, and because in this function we actually, in this file, we're not taking anything from RCPP either. I don't need that flattening of the namespace, so then now I have, you know, something, something cleaner at the added cost of explicit references to the namespace. Yep, there we go. So that's not bad. And as I mentioned, um, if you actually go in and say new project, and say Amadio, and then I say, you know, are my example package. It does the same thing as before. It creates me a package. But now I'll just show you this, the difference in just a second because I said the source directory beforehand didn't have a make was. When we're using Arma, um, it's a little bit of comment in here and a little bit of, you know, we have now an optionality where we can say, yeah, we want C++ 11 or not. But this is basically the R compatible way of just pointing to things that R already provides for us. We had a little bit of iterations needed for this, because between Linux, Windows, the Mac, when do we have OpenMP, which, you know, Clang++ version had it, didn't have it. So we sort of have this nailed down, I think, that we can refer to whether R correctly knows that it has OpenMP. So for both compilation and linking, it's enabled. And we're just linking with LAPAC, BLAST, and fortune numerics that we're getting from R. So we have to add them to tell R about the build, but we're basically telling R to use its own values. It's, it's a little convoluted, but that, that's the way it works, and it's actually, it's, it's good that way. You don't want to be explicit. And in this particular case, it looks the exact same way in Windows, but for R internal reasons, R always wants to make RAS for non-Windows systems and one for Windows systems. Long story short, Oops, no, I wanted this directory. Uh, what I wanted to show you was that um, the way we had set this up a couple of years ago, I think this actually carries over from what I've done in the um, um, package skeleton. Yep. 
so we you know there's also a hello world that just does some things on two identity matrices but then RCV armor outer product it's a bit more explicit it has a const reference but that's just what we did before x times x transpose inner product as scalar x transpose times x and to be extra cute we're doing the same thing returning a list where the list has two elements outer and inner and that's sort of the Kent up example, and it shows you how, you know, in a package, you can have a single source file providing three, um, three functions. But with that said, um, let me get back here. So that's, that's what we did there, and that's what I just showed you when I, when I um, ran it live. Um, so, um, favorite example. So many years ago, uh, a fellow who should know all this stuff much better. He's a reasonably well-known finance prof now at UCLA. And uh, because I'm nosy, I looked this up. He actually has a computer science undergrad from Bavaria. So he shouldn't actually program much more. But he was a bit of a, of a, of a nag sort of on the R help list. Now he does it mostly on the Julia list and just always you know, coming with weird questions. He never wrote code back or something. He never contributed. He, he's a smart cookie, but it was sort of, it was a little tedious. But, so he comes sort of from the same territory that I come from because I'm, you know, he's, he's a financial econometrician. That, that's sort of what I, what I did too. And the problem that he had was one that's common for us in the sense that when we don't know what asymptotic properties of an estimator are, we often just resolve to simulations. And the common problem in econometrics is that you want to look at size and power of tests. So you want to look at estimate of, of inference. So you want to loop and loop and loop and loop over and not only get um, your estimates, but you also want the covariance matrix, you want your diagonal, you want the standard error of the, the estimates. And the problem is that he wanted to do something like that, running LM over and over and over and over. And most R users learn sort of over the years that LM is really powerful, but not the fastest because it returns a really complex object. That there's a shorter version LM.fit, which is much more slimmed down, much faster, and returns you the beta hat really quickly, but it doesn't give you the standard error. So he wanted something that's as lightweight as LM fit, so that he could loop and loop and loop and loop, so that he could, uh, you know, simulate a particular case. And that got me to re-implementing a fast LM function at that time for the first time with GSL, that before we had um, Amadeo wrapped. And so over the years, I've wrote one, and it's in the RCVB GSL package. I wrote and rewrote and rewrote one in Amadeo, and the same in Eigen. And the very first one, oh, it, yeah, try and catch. The very first one in Amadeo looked like this. And it's still unattractive in the sense that it's a page long, that it has a bit of boilerplate on the catch, on the try-catch mechanism, that the function signature has explicit SEXPs in there, but hey, you know, that's what the world was like in 2011, 2012. And that we needed to do a lot of um, basically copying, transversing from the SSP type with which we transfer the R matrix to get it into the Amadeo matrix, and we did that in a two-step to be pretty efficient, and all that got, um, got rewritten, and it's much shorter now. So this was um, the next iteration. Now we just said numeric vector numeric matrix and use those to the second line. So First line int n just picks up n and k by econometrics lingo, rows, columns, and then instantiates the Amadeo matrix by reusing the, the R memory that we've gotten down because XR is our numeric matrix, and we mimic the begin iterator. That just basically points to the beginning of the memory block, and then we know n, k, um, and telling Amadeo false means don't copy. Trust us. This is the matrix. There is the memory. We will not pull the rug under. You can rely on this. And that allows for sort of fastest instantiation because it doesn't, doesn't need to copy. It's just tedious because you have to write that in and out. And then in the next version, we didn't need that anymore. The main worker code in the middle to do a uh, linear model is now about uh, just a bit more than half of the code rather than just a fraction. But we got one better still. And I think that's the current version where we follow sort of C++ interface calling convention, const and reference. Um, they're already coming in as an armor matrix and an armor vector. And all the function then does really is, is compact, readable, doing its work. In the MATLAB 
lingo, doing uh, y tilde x is solving x for y. That's you know, how in math they talk about that. So fitting is a call to solve. Residuals, of course, is the difference between your original vector and your fitted values, which I'm not calling explicitly by computing on the fly. Fitted values are uh, you know, regressor matrix times coefficients. Having the residuals, I can do transpose residuals times residuals scaled over n minus k as a scalar, and I have the matrix scaling factor sigma 2, which I then use to do the pseudo inverse, that's the inverse that Alma has, of x times x, scaled by sig 2, is my um, standard errors, because it, you know, it takes the x prime x uh, inverse and just picks the diagonal off, and with that I'm returning as before, coefficient standard error, and for um, uh, general information, the, the uh, degrees of freedom of the residuals, so the difference between n and k. And um, uh, yeah, what happened there over those two slides is that we just basically got better at implementing this and making the traversal happen. So now we just have it pretty direct, and beforehand we just um, uh, had to be more explicit about it. And the way that evolved over the years is sort of we tested that a little. Now, uh, re really quickly here, sort of just notice that the first, what is it, two, four, six, um, are all basically no time. I mean, it's a relative factor, it's sort of one to, okay, 1 to, okay, 1.6, bit of a slowdown. But that's basically, so 1.6 is LM fit to what we had done there before. Um, the last two use FRM. And that's the variable that I use there for formula notation. And what this shows is kind of cute because row number seven is our laboratory written fast rewrite of the fitting function. But if I don't stick it in and then, then I wanted that to be fancy and also support a formula interface because that's, that's what real R functions do, right? Let me see if I can write one like that as well. Um, and if I use the, the sort of that, that fast, pure, minimal implementation, but call it with the formula, my performance still sucks. And why is that? Well, because it's really expensive to build the model matrix out of a formula, so don't do that when you're in a hurry. If you're in a hurry, just give it X and Y immediately because the performance is, is, uh, is massive. You know, even even with, the, with, with that, the difference between fast LM and LM basically washes away. It's really, it's really the model matrix that is the, that is the cost. So that's the same thing again, but now without the expensive ones. And it basically shows that at the very top, uh, the results are essentially indistinguishable, and that's, uh, it, it just shows that our now more readable, shorter, uh, expressive version, the construct one, is essentially indistinguishable from what we had earlier, which was the fastest but involved more, more code and hand-holding. And, um, of course, I have the Zach David um, Kalman filter t-shirt on today. Another example I always like, that's what we cooked up for that CSDA paper that Conrad and I did. Um, this is an example that I found on the math website. It's a bit of Kalman filtering where they go in and motivate selling of MATLAB because, hey, look at this. You have a Kalman filter in MATLAB, and then we sell you this other product for max functions, and it's so much faster because it's compiled. Well, you know, just had to show that we can do that too, and you don't have to buy, buy a max file. And, and mostly they used to because the yeah, Kalman filters are cool, and the whole thing is quick. So this is the MATLAB code. Is it? Yes, this is actually MATLAB. It sort of just fits on the page. I apologize for the small uh, font. But in essence, the first half sort of just sets things up. Um, in the standard sort of, you know, common lingo, we need a matrix A and H and Q and sort of all of that. Um, and does the um, prediction step, estimation step, um, estimated state and currents gain and then returns it. And I think I did one rewrite to make it, uh, that's right, because that function got called implicitly re repeatedly, so there's a, there's a loop context that I made explicitly here now, so now it's just, you know, starting from the initial position, this sort of does the, the, does the full run. And once I had that, I could translate it into R. So this is the R equivalent of the, same page, of, of the previous page, which, you know, give or take is sort of the same length. Uh, in both cases, I think they farm out to one or two helper functions that I hadn't shown, calm and gain. And now I had this, so I had it in R, so I had a reference output. Uh, then I think there was one way that we could make this faster by, um, I think, doing the initialization only once, so I can't quite remember. 
oh yeah, sort of the initialization happens from DT on all the way to there, and then here is the loop that calls the function up, up there, and that, that then helped a little. And that one I could basically rewrite in C++, and sadly that doesn't fit on one slide, so it's several. And, you know, of course, if you're really new to C++, this is now a bit much, but it's, it's really straightforward and, of course, you know, I'm beholden because it's my code, so I'm still in love with it. It's not that inelegant. We're sticking all sort of the internal state variables in there as private variables. We're having a public interface with just the Kalman constructor. You know, the, the dimensions of this example problem are sort of hard-coded, so it's, it's not, doesn't claim to be generic, but it's, it's nicely laid out code. Um, this is the you know, continuation. Oh, no, and then it has a, so there was a constructor, and then there's a single member function estimate, and that one just fits on the screen. That's basically one of the halves of the previous functions before, but we can now separate out initialization, where variables are kept in the actual work, and this is now in C++. And then in R, we can basically just, you know, call that. Do me that Kalman example in C++ with the matrix Z, we instantiate k, and then say, you know, estimate me k based on that position vector z, and return the final position. And um, with that, and of course on my laptop I don't have MATLAB, so I, don't, I can't show you the, um, the comparison to that. So this was the first naive translation from MATLAB, uh, about 14 seconds, 15 seconds for 500 runs, and a more efficient versions where I kept invariance out of the loop shaves off, um, you know, three seconds, three and a half seconds, and then from there to C++, even though the R code, you know, wasn't doing all that much, many of which were already vectorized optimization, we're still getting out a factor of four, which is really not so bad. And that is the R plot that I reproduced, which corresponds to what's on the math work side in the story about that example. So yay, Kalman filter. With light blue, the, um, the observed trajectory, you know, these motivating examples are always the same. You have a 2D robot, and you, know, you want to estimate it, and the, and the darker, um, how the linear, uncentered, most basic Kalman filter observes and reproduces that. So um, it's a nice self-contained example. It's a bit hard to follow over the several screens, but that's just that. Here's the first and older example about sparse matrices, because someone over coffee also brought up sparse. Um, there's more of it now, or they're sort of the same, but more efficiently. One way of using that here, for example, is to resort to the matrix package. The matrix package uh, has several representations of sparse matrices. There's, couple, there's, there's several standards in, in the industry. Um, I th and I always get the naming wrong. I think this one's CSC. Or maybe it's GGC, or what it says there. But anyway, basically you're saying, you're passing three uh, elements. Uh, I and J as positions, and then J and X as the load, and you see that, you know, I is 1, and then 3 to 8, row indices, J is 2, 9, and then 6 to 10, so that's value 7, 14, and the others, and the payload is actually 7 times 1 to 7, and you see how it hopscotches there, 7 to 14, so we have a, uh, you know, an 80 element matrix with uh, 7 elements. And if in R you, yeah, it's CSC format. Um, if in R you do a stir on that, then it tells you, yes, it's a, you know, an S4 class with these slots, these elements. Even though we instantiate it with I and J and X, the internal representation you now notice is I and P and X. Um, that just has to do with how people do sparse matrices, uh, which is the comment that I make there. Exactly from I, J, X, we turned into CSC format with I, P, X. Um, that makes some computations more efficient, and we can access these things. I got, I got asked about that a few times by, uh, by Soren, uh, at, uh, you know, the, the organizer of Use R in Arburg a couple of years ago. He does a lot with graph theoretical stuff, which they also do in sparse matrices, so we always had use cases, and he did some stuff with Eigen and some with Amadeo. So here is uh, one older way of... Um, of setting things up. Um, we're basically coming in with an S4 object from matrix, out of which we're picking I, P, and X, the things that I showed you from um, the SDR representation, which we get just as we see them in the SDR representation by accessing the elements dot slot. 
So for S4 classes, that's just, that's just how it works. Dot slot is, you know, what the ambassador would be at the R prompt. And then owning I, P, and X, we stick them into an ARMA SP mat. And with that, we have the SP mat. And if the Boolean show is true, then we print that. And here, then we get this print, slightly different um, form. Uh, the matrix package has shown us the full matrix, which has the fills. This one prefers to show us the index tuples and then the payload and has a, a bit more informative summary, dimensions 8 by 10 with seven non-zero elements, which corresponds to eight and three quarters of, uh, of density. Um, ah, yes, so here we are. This is to that question earlier and then leading to ML pack a little bit. So what do we do when we want external packages, right? I mean, I went on to that in passing. Um, and here is the order reverse. The easiest case is the one at the bottom. Headers only. If you can do that, great. So if you're on the look at, uh, lookout for additional functionality and you have choice between different implementations and they are otherwise equivalent and one's headers only, by all means, do headers only. It's much easier to get, um, get colleagues, friends, students, neighbors to be using that. Uh, with linking, you can do what... Um, uh, what some existing packages do. Um, and then just pray that the other systems has those libraries that, that you depend upon. Or you can do what a fair number of packages on, on CRAN do um, because you can't always assume that they're there and just rebuild the library that you depend upon when your package installs. It's costly when you're developing the package and building over and over, but for your users it's not so bad, especially, say, Windows users of CRAN because the compile time is, is born by CRAN and everybody just gets the zip file. So that's, uh, but that's really a topic where I wish I could make our life even easier, but we're not there yet. So there's some more work to be done. And with that, because I really needed to get you all in the room, I had to put a little bit sort of, you know, of the, of the hype and the sexy in. So here's now, uh, here's now machine learning. Basically, as a as another good application of Amadeo. Uh, everybody loves machine learning. I mean, we were, as, as, as data nerds, we were all curious about it. I even had started with a friend in New York to packaging Shark. That was a project, I think, between two, I think, a Danish and a German university. But we didn't quite get to it. And somebody else did it, and there was a package on it, but that disappeared. Um, there's a fairly large and old library that, for some reason, never got that much limelight called DLIP. And we have a package dlib for that. Um, that has quite a bit of functionality. And then there's MLPack. Um, and yeah, MLPack is neat. Uh, it has a bit of a weird looking website. I haven't met Ryan yet. Uh, after all those years, I met, I met Conrad from our deal fame this week. Because I'm in his hometown, so he couldn't hide. Uh, so we had a beer. Um, we're still talking. Uh, and yeah, so Ryan was at Georgia Tech for a couple of years, and this was his labor of love. I'm, I'm not sure if that was a dissertation topic, but I mean, he obviously, he worked on stuff that he implemented with this. And he was there for a couple of years and had supervised a metric ton of students. There's a lot of sort of contributors' names on there, and it's, it's good. Um, if you like Amadio, as I do, you will like MLPack, because it reads well, it performs well. And RCPP colleague and contributor, um, KK had packaged MLPack, which I call LMPack V1 a couple of years ago by embedding it. And as it then sometimes goes, that was sort of useful, but we were stuck with that version. I, I have that with some other packages too. Um, that was, I think, literally version 1 dot something of MLPack. And by the next version, MLPack itself had extended build requirements that required libraries that we cannot assume that CRAN has, some boost libraries with linking. So we never got MLPack v2 onto CRAN. It's sort of active and there, but at this point only on, on GitHub. So what I'm going to show you is a mix between the two, but, but more of this. So a good year or so ago, I put some more work in and revived this. And then it's updated a couple of weeks ago because Amadeo, um, MLPack is not version 3. But it's not quite there yet. So this is copy and pasted from their website. There's a metric ton of functions there. It's good. Sort of all the standards um, by um, MLPack version 3 now. Also some 
deep learning things. Um, I think at this point all um, implemented on the CPU, but you know, sort of all the standard methods for um, supervised and unsupervised learning are there. Uh, version two didn't have too much yet in metaparameter tuning. Version three added that. I haven't milked that that hard. And some of the usage is um, is just you know plain, simple, elegant. Uh, sort of what I aimed for and got to was the third version of FastML. So. Not that anybody or the world needs another k-means implementation, but because it's a simple and well, uh, well understood problem, sort of here it is. If you come in with a matrix of data and a number of clusters you desire, it's that straightforward. Um, you um, reserve a vector of you know, cluster assignments of, of solutions. Um, instantiate a k-means object here with all default arguments. There's many toggles you could set. And then you just call that k-means object and say, cluster me this data for that many clusters into variable assignments. And with RCBP, we just return a list containing clusters and assignments. And I think that was the one demo function that KK had put into the old one. And I just copied his benchmark here. So, um, and I didn't rerun that. So maybe by now that's you know, 20 or 25 times, but because Ask K means, I guess, does more things in R or does more, I don't know, expensive NA testing or whatever. We're having a sort of a 30x. Sir, can I ask a question? Yep. Does ML Park has GPU capability? Say that again? Does ML Park has GPU capability? GPU? I'm not sure. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I was just thinking about that too because Conrad has a sort of side project or a next project. I mean, he's not working on it as much as he does in Amadeo doing basically Amadeo extensions that farm off to the GPU. So, I mean, everybody wants some of that, but not all of that is there because it takes a moment to do it right. So, um, maybe coming. I'm, I, um, I'm not sure. Or possibly for some of the under, yeah, or, yeah, we, we got to see. I don't know. We got to got to ping Ryan on. Um, here's a linear regression example, which already shows you that um, you know they're doing some extra things. It's not just doing y tilde x; it does the same with the regularization step. So um, I think this would um, um, there's elastic net implementation too, but I think here the lambda just does a ridge. Yeah, but if you have the value set to zero, it doesn't ridge and it defaults back to standard stuff. And then you just have a bool for calling um, with an intercept or without an intercept. That's still the initial format. I'm slowly sort of trying to change more functions into a test uh, uh, training set and, and validation test set um, comparison. But, you know, this is, this is how we could just compare that the regression actually does the, does the right thing. I think this is standard. Um, uh, oh, no, it's, it's not. That's right. I commented out the summary because the, the page would, would overrun. But this is, this is, you know, this is real, real nitter. So you know, the results are the same after you make sure that you're really just comparing the coefficients and, and not one named vector to another vector. So it gives us the same as. Um, y tilde x in, in LM with the usual trees example of log volume explained by log width and height. Um, so this is a bit more interesting because as I was sort of slowly working over that, I finally realized that I wanted a slightly different interface than I had with linear regression, so I may, may change that. So this shows the thing that we added a year or two ago. We now have RCVP nullable. And that was needed. There's a bit of C++ structure that's needed. It basically allows us to have a function signature with two required and one optional arguments. So you can call it with a training matrix um, and a vector of labels, but no test matrix if you don't want to. And if that's the case, then um, we're just returning the parameters. Then in the final if else, we're just in the else branch. But if it's not null, and that's how the nullable gets used, then we're if the matrix test is not null, then we're using this instance of, 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 of nullable of test to instantiate an ALMA matrix test too. And we're using the results from the prior um, fit to, um, um, uh, 
uh, where's LRC? So the logistic regression um, uses train data in train and labels and fills things in the LRC object. We're then using the LRC object to basically do the predict step, which for logistic regression here is called classify, storing the results in um, uh, results UR. Uh, what did I call it UR? I don't remember. And basically then just, you know, it tracks results and return that. So if you have a test set, then you get the results of the test set back. If you don't have a test set, you just get the parameters back. And I did that with one or two other ones, and it's still relatively um, straightforward. Uh, here's, a, um, here's a nearest neighbor example. Um, again, in the old format, um, it has a ton of uh, nearest neighbor metrics um, and variations around there. Um, the package is, ML pack is really quite rich, and many of these initial examples I just took from the unit test because they're, they're small, concise, and, and, doc and, and, and as well as examples. So that's... Um, um, that was ML pack, um, and with that we're sort of coming uh, coming to a close. And I can just tell you about you know available documentation and other things, and then take a couple of questions before we close. So in RCPP we have a bunch of PDF vignettes. Those over the years um, have accumulated stuff from. Uh, um, that page didn't get updated because I have, uh, yeah, so uh, for RCPP it's actually now two papers. There was the old JSS paper and um, um, we have a more recent one in the American Statistician. Um, the aforementioned Amadio paper, there's an Eigen paper by Doug and myself, there's a mailing list, there's Stack Overflow, and then there's blog posts. Uh, my website with old slide presentations. Uh, this I showed you during, um, during the tutorial. This is what the gallery website looks like when you scroll down a little and drop the search bar on top. It's just basically a chronological list of, um, <coughs> of articles in there uh, under recently published. And there's a um, high value added tag uh, feature, I think we called it, for you know, uh, more, more important ones than in the first set and don't, don't bubble out chronologically. The page is old. There's a book. It's still there. It still sells. Uh, it doesn't say as much about attributes as it as it should. That's just a, sort of a minimal addition to it, um, mentioning in a few places. Most of the examples are still with inline. That being said, uh, you know all the basic structure that it said about internal representation, how to go from R to C plus plus, of course, is still true. Uh, what happened there? I'm on power. With 15 minutes to go, that's. Uh, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm near the end. Ah, so. oh, thank you. Yeah. So there's the book. Um, there's a couple of online compliments to it. Uh, there's a really well done um, site in, I think it's Japan, um, GitHub user Toiba. Uh, that comes up every now and then. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, James Palamuta has one tailored after the Amadio documentation, also in RCPP. You know, maybe one day we'll sit down and wrap that up, but they, they, they haven't really morphed into, um, into a full book yet. And, um, yeah, with that, um, I'm at question stage. That's common C++ usage, yes. You, you, uh, uh, you have to because otherwise if the files are called A, B, and C, right, and A wants something that's in C, it doesn't know that it's there. So that's why you then often have a you know, it can be a header, or you can actually write it by hand as a common line, but you have to have the declaration in there. So, you know, int, foo, abc, so, but once you have that, then the compiler can operate to it. And, and in the, the simplification that we get from our packages is that everything that's in the source directory will end up in the, in the local library that is the shared object of the package, and with that be available. So that's pretty cool. Is there an equivalent to browser for RCPP? That's like my number one go-to when I don't understand how something works in R and 
Yeah, no, that's a good one. Um, sort of yes. So I mean, I still have to admit that I, I, I don't use that as much as I should because that, that's, that's, that's a really good facility. But the, the basic answer is that these interactive debuggers were more or less modeled after, um, after the compiled code debuggers. Um, and um, um, I'm not quite sure where we're at with, um, with that, with our studio. I think that was sort of planned, but it's a, it's a lot of work. But so in writing our extensions is, is a hint to something like that. Well, you know, how do I debug external code? But, um, and I have worked examples somewhere, but in essence what you do is, um, you know, you start an R session with, with that option. Let me make that a little bigger. I uh, you know, don't have a prepared example yet, but now, now we have R started, but R dispatches to the debugger. So now I'm, if you're a C and C++ programmer, you may have seen this before, and it's not as intimidating. This is now a prompt of the debugger, and now you can say, you know, break, that would be line 100. Um, but we haven't got the code loaded, so then you just basically say to the debugger, run, which, you know, I was on hold in the debugger, and then I told the debugger, oh, you know, the program that you just loaded, just, just go off because I knew I would get to an R prompt. So it's a little, you know, Russian dolls boxes. Now, within the context of the debugger, now I'm in R. So now I can do library my headache, you know, the package I want to debug. I mean, I, obviously I don't have one here, but suppose it was there, it would now be loaded. At this point now, the... Um, um, uh, the, the object code of the package is loaded. And I think there's a trick. So the write-up is there. I think at this point then we want to get back to the debugger and set the breakpoint now that the object code is there. Or maybe maybe you can actually do that lazy in the debugger too that you kind of just set break and function so and so. Now the function is there and then you just basically you, know, you just basically run it. This is from R. It dispatches back to your code, which is fenced in by the debugger with a breakpoint in a certain function, and the thing that the debugger knows is when it gets to that function, it sits there. And, but, you know, it's all, it's all then in the interface of GDB and not, not your R browser, but they're, they're actually they're similar. They're modeled the same way. There's little N, there's little D with print. You can print out values. It's, it's a bit of an acquired art um, to come to peace with the debugger, but that's, that's the closest that we have for that, that that's meant for that. And you, uh, yeah, um, you, can, uh, you can get to it. But, you know, not, not as easily as we would like to. I mean, I had a similar question over coffee on how do you do profiling. It's the same, it's the same issue. We are sort of here in mixed mode between R and C++. And, and uh, that's really powerful. I find it really cool to sit at the R REPL so that I can immediately just generate data, call something out, get results back, visualize, summarize, and what have you. But it makes interfacing with the compiled code a little, a little more tedious. I'm not sure who was next between the three of you. That is correct. Um, so if I were to write some C++ code, I'd like to you know, use maybe Python and R and so on, what would you recommend? Would you recommend like writing a C++ and then sort of writing a laptop? What I do in my day job. It's the same thing, right? So then, that, I mean, not, not for the Python example, but often you have, you, it, it's a great question. Often you want to interoperate with other users or you want to compose a piece of code that you want to call from R but not make dependent on R. And that's, that's exactly the way you just, just described it. We have the interfacing um, done for both our more efficient you know, proxy classes, numeric vector just being you know, a vector in R, integer vector and in vector. But we do the same transfer back and forth easily for standard vector in, standard vector double. Um, so what I found is the smoothest paradigm is, you know, write a lot of sort of C++ stuff. Don't have the R headers in there. Just, you know, just so that it could get packaged up as a pure C++ library and test it or whatever. And then basically for each function call, have, have, have one caller that, you know, deals with getting the arguments from R, maybe checking one more time, and then calling the C++ code and getting it back. And then you basically have very 
thin shims and, and the main work is done in the main library and that is then super portable. It's, it's a great example. It comes up every now and then sort of with, you know, with vaporware or, or with stuff that's pretty new. So Apache Arrow, right? Pure C++, two different, different projects. The only smaller project that I know of is Fast Cluster. That was uh, due to was a PhD student at Stanford and he did C++ code in an R package on CRAN with R and Python bindings. So he still, I guess, his heart beats close on the R than on the Python side. Um, but that was one of the very few examples that I know that had that always uh, wired in. I think he may have been Swiss. He's now at Google Zurich. Uh, but that's, that's sort of a good working example. I think we should have more of that. Uh, and I think Arrow and these things will help that we get richer common data structures so we can abstract a little <coughs> bit away, focus on the stuff that's then uh, end user implementation independent so that we get better footprint, you know, more users, more eyes on it. And, and then just have sort of narrow, efficient pipelines to the uh, to the wrappers where we want to deploy them. I, I think that's a that's a really good use case. A little bit of extra work because you have to put the one shim level in, but you know that's that really can be minutes with the tools that we have. You know, I refer to that a little bit. That has to do with the external library things. Then, then you as a sysadmin level and requirements level, and sometimes you can't avoid it because you need library X, Y, and Z, and then you just have to sort it out. But you have some design degrees of freedoms to, you know, then maybe not use library X, Y, and Z, which is difficult to ship or install or has license constraints or whatever. But yeah, that's, in, in bigger systems, that's, that's sort of, that's, that's par for the course. I mean, the question comes up in any, anyhow, but yeah, it's just, the nice thing really is that because the um, R package building environment and caretaking of options for compilers and other things is so rich that we can, with a straight face, uh, claim that we don't put any additional burden on you. You know, we just, on Windows, we want you to have R tools. On the Mac and on Linux, you want you to have a compiler, which is standard, and yeah, and, 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 off, and off you go. And everything after that, when you build bigger systems, I mean, those are then constraints that, that that you build in, and I mean, we help as much as we can with those because that's the nice thing about having a corpus as, you know, as of yesterday's 1,395 packages. Of those, there are maybe, I don't know, I'm guessing now 100 that use external libraries, right? And some ship them, some bring them, some copy them over, but yes, many problems have been tackled and sometimes you can copy them or sometimes they're still left open or have been tackled in a way that you may not want to replicate. So, I mean, it's just, yeah. That one, that one's still out there, but it, you know, it's just—it's it, really—it's really not a problem that we've created. I mean, it's just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's a general problem that providing something uh, easily to three prominent uh, implementation platforms, architectures, is just not trivial. We're just sort of spoiled in the way that that R gets to us on all of those so easily. So we want our stuff there too, and and that that sometimes it's just it's just work. Uh, yeah, I think it's called depends equal. At, at when, when, you, when you do CPP function, your thing, and then uh, it actually doesn't have the depends in the string, uh, but you, s and I always get that wrong. It's either, pl it's not plug-in. I think it's depends equal. If you look at the help page for CPP function, it should, it should, come, uh, it should come up. It, it's definitely doable because it, you, um, it, 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 the, the option just basically tells the compiler where to look for the header files, and, um, you know, you, you could also do it with package CSX flags, but there's a, there's an official way for it, and um, you know, if I was really good, oops, um, it might even be in the help page, but it may not be. But I mean, that's that's a, it's a common enough case. Um, yep, it depends. It's the second argument. Then let me see if we have an example here. Yep. So you want, you want something like this. Pleasure. Oh, uh, I mean, it's just a name that we gave for something that 
uh, allows you to pass additional compilation and linking options to the build. So you need it for CPP function if, so for example, you want OpenMP, you have to tell the compiler to supply the command line argument, the compiler argument minus F OpenMP. And the OpenMP plugin does that. Likewise, if you want uh, C11, on the command line, it would be G++ da, 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 minus standard equals C11. So you have to supply an additional argument. And, and plugin is a, is a mechanism in the package structure where RCPP and a client package can talk back and forth so that the client package can provide a plugin that RCPP can then call. So uh, that, that's basically how it works. Because when you, when you load the other package, it lets RCPP know that, oh, I have these plugins, and then it can resolve to those. It sounds more complicated than it is. It's just it's a convenient way to set some options that you may need for the functionality you desire. Anything else? I'll, I'll be here, of course, for days. I mean, I'm happy to break over lunch now, too. Um, Right now, I have the screen and the machine up, so if, um, if you wanted me to show another example or something, I could... Oh, that's why I didn't show, so that's the usual stuff. Now, I preempted that for once and showed you where this slide deck sits, otherwise, otherwise they're usually on that page, and my web page, and mail, and GitHub, and Twitter, and all the other stuff. And because I have a mouse full of letters as a family name, it's also relatively easily Googleable. So. Cool. And uh, yeah, with that, um, thanks for your time. And uh, um, we we have the mailing list. The, the mailing list is pretty good because it's you know several people lurk and will answer and help if it's if it's obvious. Um, Stack Overflow is just a few of us. I think fewer than on the mailing list, but you get answers too. Um, but yeah. So give it give it give it a shot and, and reach out if you're uh, if you're stuck. Thank you.